Hi everyone, welcome to episode 3 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Bhargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they use to succeed and advice that they have to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Justin Dry, who was the co-founder and co-CEO of Vinamofo, a group buying website for wine that recently closed a $25 million round of funding. In this interview, Justin shares the story behind Vinamofo and how they got through their lean years, the importance of building a community, deciding when to pivot, and how to choose between multiple options on the table. I had a blast doing this interview, and I hope you enjoy it too. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Justin Dry. Hi, Justin. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast. Thank you, Rohit. Pleasure to be here. So it's a great space that you've got over here. Yeah, look, um, we've just been in the building now for about six months. Love it. It's about five times the size of our last office, which is really, really cool because we finally actually have spare meeting rooms. (laughs) The last one had like one meeting room for, I think we had about 90 people back then, and one meeting room. So all the meetings for the business would take place on different couches around the the office and even in the stairwell. (laughs) It was like called Beanbag Alley and that was one of our meeting rooms. So it's really nice to have so much space um, for everyone again, even though we're kind of filling it up again. (laughs) Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the business obviously growing really quickly still, which is nice. Um, we're up to, I think, about 140 people across the, the two businesses. The Vino Mofo has about 120. Um, and we seem to be hiring a lot of new people every, every single week. So who knows where that stops? <laughs> <laughs> but it's really exciting part of the journey, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously, Vino Mofo has been a, a huge success um, you know, recently raised a $25 million round uh, as well. But um, what people might not be as familiar with is uh, is your story that, that led up to Vinamofo, uh, namely Quaff. Um, the is lean that how years. I say it? Yeah, it is Quaff. It is yeah. Quaff, yeah. You're one of the few that gets that right. Um, the, the lean years, we like to call them. <laughs> uh, Quaff, we launched, that was launched with Andre, who's my brother in law and co founder of Vinamofo. Um, we launched that in 2007, I think. Um, we created it in 2006, actually launched it officially in 2007. And that was like, that was the culmination of two different projects that we were both working on individually. Um, I had, uh, like in kind of early, mid 2006, I think it was, um, I had kind of broken up with my long-term girlfriend, um, sold up everything and went traveling in South America for like six months. And um, the, the, the journey was, you know, clear my head, get away from everything and come up with my next business. And, um, and, you know, so I was traveling around South America as a backpacker for six months, having heaps of fun. And, um, and I'd always had an interest in wine. Um, I studied at uni. I grew up in, you know, you know my um, uncle and, um, was a viticulturist. The other uncle was involved in it as well. That, there was a long history in wine um, with my family. And so I love technology. And um, I was fascinated by businesses, obviously. So I was traveling around South America as a backpacker, drinking lots of good wine. Um, and while I was over there, I discovered this thing called Facebook. <laughs> and uh, the, the way, it hadn't hit Australia yet, and it was um, a couple of the fellow travelers, the other backpackers were American. Um, and the way they were keeping in contact with each other was on Facebook. And I was like, and they invited me so I could, you know, keep in contact with them as we were traveling around the continent. And, um, and I was like, shit, I reckon it's going to be pretty big, you know? <laughs> I picked it early. I should have tried to buy shares, which I, it was probably too late by then anyway. But um, you anyway, know, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And so I started playing around with this kind of Facebook and this community um, and, you know, playing around with that and wine and what I could do in the tech space. And so by the time I finished my trip and came back to Australia, I was like, I want to do the Facebook for wine. You know, at that stage, not realizing how much I was niching <laughs> Facebook yeah. and uh, how hard that would be. But um, so then I was, it was the Christmas uh, of that year that I was telling Andre at family Christmas. Um, and he's like, you know what? That sounds very familiar, that, that similar to something that I'm looking at. And so he takes me out to the garage um, where his office kind of was. And he shows me this thing called Red Cellar. And it's a website that he'd started to build with a friend um, or his friend was starting to build it for him. And it was like wine reviews, so consumer reviews. So back in 2006, whatever, that was quite still early for you know, Amazon customer reviews. Um, it was very similar, but based on each wine. And uh, so anyway, it's like it was customer reviews, so a community around customer reviews. And I was trying to build this like Facebook for wine. And it's like, wow, you know, okay, they kind of work well together. Um, and, you know, uh, but God, 
to come to that decision to go, oh, it's a really good idea, brothers-in-law that don't really get along. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's combine forces and, and build this together. But, you know, we had a few wines and by the end of the Christmas um, celebration, we were like, ah, okay, let's just go into business together. <laughs> and that was the birth of Quaff. And so Quaff um, was like this kind of community of wine lovers that would rate and review wines and talk to each other, build a... Um, build a, uh, like a network within our site and um, just you know, get geeky about wine. And, uh, and we thought this was gonna be a great business model. We'd sell it to wineries and they would wanna pay us to be in front of this audience. Um, and little did we know that no one really wanted to pay us. <laughs> and it was a really, really tough sell, you know. Um, back then, you know, the wineries were talking to were like, well, what, what do you mean? Consumers talking about our wine product? They don't know anything about wine. And we we're like, well, that one is the worst attitude you possibly have about your, your consumers, your, yeah. the, you know, the people that are buying wine off you. Um, and, uh, and two, it's happening. It's going to happen anyway. So you can either join in the conversation and be part of it, or you can just avoid it by putting your head in the sand. And, you know, even despite our best efforts to convince them, we just weren't getting enough people um, to, to come across and, and make it a viable business. So um, we spent the next four years trying to make it a viable business and every year got better. Um, the first year was really sucky. Like I think we earned like, I don't know, it was 20 or 30 grand between two people, which is not a lot of money. Um, and, then this, and then the second year we kind of, we we're always looking for opportunities to pivot the business, to use a cliche term in startup world, but um, the second year, after very little success within the quaffing, um, we created an online wine show. We still use the quaff platform and that audience that we were building up um, to, you know, we leverage that to show them and spread the message, but we created something called Road to Vino, which was born out of, um, I went away for Christmas and uh, came back with it's kind of like the time that all my new ideas come. I go away from work, come up with something crazy, and come back and try and pitch it to Andre. And um, and so I went away and I was like, I came back and said, Andre, I've got an idea. And he's like, Okay, Justin, tell me about your idea. And I'm like, Well, I've always wanted to buy a combi and travel around Australia surfing and drinking wine, like visiting all the wine regions. And he's like, I don't see the business model, mate. <laughs> and I was like, Fair point. But he's, but his background had been in like video production and editing and um, and you know within winery the winery space um, particularly of late and he's like but you know what we could do we could film it and then we could turn it into a show and try to get sponsorship and I was like done let's do it so then we uh, so then we bought a combi which was like it was found at a bloody lemon orchard should have been like the first sign of to stay away <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go and we were going to do it up and. We spent six months, like you know, uh, uh, trying to get rid of the rust and fix the engine, and it, eventually we was like, "Oh, we can't do this. We're gonna, this is going, this show is going to start when we're 50." So we went out and bought another combi that actually went, um, and left the other one to kind of rot. Um, and uh, we started. So we got a sound and video guy, and we took him with us, and we picked up the combi. Didn't start the first time we got there. We bought it like sight unseen online, and. Um, it was, you know, it had a few issues, <laughs> but it did start eventually with the help of um, like a mechanic, and we started filming our first show, Road to Finos, and we did it in the Hunter Valley, and it was all about just um, meeting um, and uh, experiencing four or five days with all the cool kind of rock star winemakers and all the legends. So you'd have someone like a up and coming rock star like an Andrew Thomas from Thomas Wines, and you'd have a legend like the Tyrrell family, you know, and so we got to live and breathe each region for four or five days, which means we felt we built incredible network of amazing people because we, we were hand selecting all the best people that we could possibly want to work with. And then we were spending four or five days with them, like, you know, sleeping on the couch, having long lunches, having really late nights, drinking all the great booze that they made and, and just getting silly and having fun. A couple of young guys traveling around the country, tasting wine. It was like the best lifestyle, <laughs> but it built this great network of, um, of people. So. When we released the first episode, um, Wine Australia got in contact with us and said, love what you're doing, no one's talking about wine this way, no one's doing any production of this level, um, so we'd love to sponsor the show. And we are like, fuck, it's working, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> and they gave us a decent sized check, and then um, that enabled us to continue doing it. It wasn't heaps of money, but it was enough to be able to get to the next region, and then the regional body would support us, and then the you know, tourism bodies would support us. So it was enough to just get by and pay the you know, the bills along the way. Um, still wasn't a great year as far as financially or anything, but um, it was really fun. And, and, that, and so, yeah, like I said, it, um, we got by and it also built our network of yep. amazing people within this space. Um, and then, once again, at the end of the year, we didn't earn a heap of money and, you know, his 
Uh, Andre's married to my sister um, and they had two young kids. So, you know, we don't earn any money um, and your sister is married to your business partner who's also not earning any money. Christmas is a pretty freaking average. <laughs> it's like, you know, Jody's always tapping on the shoulder, Justin, is it going to be better next year? <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jody, I love you to death, but I don't know. Um, and, but anyway, so we, we decided like on that next year, um, we were looking for another pivot because Road to Vino was really fun and the sponsorship was getting us by, but it wasn't, wasn't everything. So next we came up, it was actually on the way to SA Tourism we came up, I was on the way to Andre's place to go to SA Tourism to get them to sponsor Road to Vino. And I'd just come across Foursquare and Go Wallet, which are like check-in apps before yep. Facebook was doing that thing. And um, I started playing around with like this concept of like, what could we do in the wine space? Maybe we could create a check-in app. And everyone who was on our, you know, on our um, database, um, our audience would get on this thing and they'd check into wineries and wine bars or whatever and they'd get a special offer when they got there. So, you know, if you went to a winery in the Brossa, um, you'd check in and then you'd get like a half price deal or you'd get um, like a, a back tasting of all their vintage, wine, like just crazy good experience that you don't normally get. Um, anyway, so I told Andre that morning and he's like, he got really excited about it. So in the 20 minutes from his place to the SA Tourism, we created this pitch about this new mobile check-in app. And, um, and they loved it. <laughs> and so they gave us like two or three times the amount of money that we were looking for for Road to Vino sponsorship just to do this thing. And that was called the Great South Australian Wine Adventure. So we, built, so we hadn't even built it, we just created it in our head that day. And then, so we hired a developer quickly and built this app out um, and just hacked it together really super quickly. Um, and we launched it like I don't know, a month or two later. Um, and it went really well and wineries uh, kept on coming on board, that, so they paid an amount of money to be part of it. Um, we had like 100 plus wineries just in South Australia, I think it was, um, all doing this, and they were sharing with all their um, audience through social, every check-in went through social, so we were building this mass brand awareness around this app, which was super cool. So then the next year we rolled it out Australia-wide, um, and that was the third kind of pivot, I guess, of the business, and that did really well, all the while using Quaff, and the Quaff site's still there, and filming Quaff TV, and doing all that stuff, and writing content, but there was all these businesses being laid upon Quaff and the audience, Sure. Um, and then, uh, and so that we started getting lots of, um, like winning lots of awards, so in the wine space, we were starting to become very well known, no one knew us outside of the wine space, but within the wine space, you know, we're on all the magazine covers, and we were the young digital wine dudes. And so everyone was getting super excited about talking to us about how they could manage their own digital social. So there leads the fourth pivot, which was, um, uh, well, that was the third pivot. Third pivot led, led to a, like a digital social agency. We kept getting asked to do this for people. And so we started building out our team and saying yes, because they were offering lots of money to um, manage their own channels as well as we were managing our own. And uh, that, <laughs> that was good. We, took, we got some great wineries on board, like really super premium brands, and we had great relationships with them. Um, and money started looking better. Still not, because every time we got a new business and started earning lots more money, we had to hire heaps more people. Yeah. So, so the team was growing, but Andre and I were taking no more money home, and it was like just so frustrating <laughs> for my family, because you're like working so hard, you're getting some level of success, but you're getting no money. And so Andre and I almost gave up, um, but never did, but there was times where we looked at getting other jobs just because this was all so hard and our poor family, Christmas after Christmas, not being able to afford to do anything interesting, you know, and young family, it was just, it was really, really, really tough. While the rest of the uh, industry were looking at, oh, look at the success of these boys, you know, we were, cons we were called the Quaff Boys, like, look at the success of these Quaff Boys, and um, yet yeah, we were like going home to Christmases and having no bloody money to buy anything. Um, <laughs> And anyway, so fast forward to the final pivot, which was Vino Mofo, and that was once again I was I went away for Christmas, and I was I could it was 2010. I, I was watching Groupon was the fastest growing uh, business in the world at that stage, um, and uh, I could see this the group buying daily deals thing was starting to come, and we had this huge audience, huge in those days, not now, but um, big audience back then of wine lovers that were all kind of young and interested in digital and talking. It was a great community. Um, so I knew that we had this audience that loved wine. I, we, I knew that we had this network of great relationships within the wine industry. We knew all the cool kids. We knew all the legends of the wine industry. And then I could see this business model coming and it was just a matter of time before it hit Australia. And so I, I put those things together and I approached Andre and said, I've got an idea. <laughs> and I said, well, it's like group buying daily deals type for wine. And he was like, 
no fucking way. I'm not getting, I'm not touching that. And we're like, I was like, why? And he's like, well, it's just dirty, you know? Like, and I said, but what if we do it for premium to super premium wine? We have like absolute realness and passion for the wine like we do anyway. And we treat it with the respect that it deserves with the, um, you know, with the history of these families and the wine regions and whatever. And I eventually kind of convinced him that we could do it in a way that wasn't like your bottom of the barrel type things that um, other people have tried. Um, we could do it in a really nice way. And uh, eventually he said yes. Um, he also was worried that we had like four businesses on the go <laughs> and we had all these people and I wanted to start another one. Uh, but eventually he said yes and so we built it. Um, we brought on two kind of uh, small investors to be part of it. One ended up working within the business as well, um, Lee Morgan, um, who's no longer with the business but he was at that start. Um, at that stage, and um, Greg, who's just um, was this lovely kind of industry guy that put a little bit of money in. We launched it two months later. Um, it was April 2011, and it just like poof, took off. And you know, it was that point where we were going, we were like, like going, oh shit, this is actually working. Like, don't stuff it up, don't <laughs> stuff it up. <laughs> we don't, you know, we don't know how we're doing it, but it's doing it. And let's just not get in the way. So, and that was like super exciting for us because we could just see that this was the one. Yeah. Um, and then eventually everything that we built, which we used to get to Vino Mofo, was folded in yep. to Vino Mofo. Um, and you know staff um, and all the kind of you know whatever else that comes with business you know yeah. <laughs> computers desk tables lease <laughs> all that stuff um, was folded into Vino Mofo and about six months in and everything else was kind of kind of uh, finished up and wrapped up and we went all in on Vino. Sure. Um, I just wanted to dive in a, a little bit deeper into. So you mentioned there were four pivots uh, in all in in the in the journey. What uh, what instigated each pivot? Was it just you had an idea? Um, things weren't quite working and you just said let's let's give this a go or because I'm mindful as you mentioned you know you were doing four different things all, all yep. at the same time how do you you know uh, doing one thing is, is hard enough how do you add on additional things yeah I think it came about because it wasn't working one yep. like the the ones that we were doing while they're exciting and building audience and networks they financially weren't working for us so there was a need to, 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 to pivot to change to look for other opportunities Two, I just get really excited about the space. Like I'm always looking for opportunities and it's, it's dangerous sometimes always looking out for other opportunities, but when you actually need it financially, then it's not as, you know, it's, it's the necessary move. Um, so I think it was probably opportunity um, and some necessity to do that. Um, and I reckon we got better in each, in each business model and pivot because we understood the market more, we understood our consumers more, um, and I think like, the first ones were done as businesses that were for Andre and I. Do you know what I mean? We were like, oh, this is really cool. People will love it. We didn't go the consumer-facing way. Like, we didn't go, what do they want? <laughs> <laughs> it was, so it was, when we got to, by the time we got to Vino, it was a point where we went, um, do they want amazing deals on incredible wines and to be treated like humans and see behind the you know, all that stuff? And it's like, of course they do. People want to buy amazing wines at incredible prices. How long has it taken us to get to that point? You know, like whereas the early days, oh no, that we think this is a really cool idea as opposed to looking at it from their side. Um, and then I think we just got better at business and we got better at hiring and we got better at um, understanding the triggers of what makes people excited about things. And we understood more about how you build a strong community. Um, yeah, I think it was, it was a combination of all those things, um, not one single. Sure, and, uh, and and so again, something that you mentioned earlier was you know the how Christmases were, were really difficult. Four years is, is a really long time to go with with the pressure off young families, partners, mm. uh, you know, not not making enough money. What? And you mentioned that there were a couple of times that you and Andre talked about you know getting jobs or, or kind of moving away and, and shifting focus. What kept both of you going through through that period? Um, uh, being complete idiots, probably. <laughs> no, I think. It wasn't us that we, we never wanted to give in, like we never wanted to give up and it was more about the people around us that we cared about. So my, I, I wasn't married, I didn't have kids and it was more about my sister and her and Andre's family. Uh, you know, we were working out of their garage for the first few years so I would see the kids every day, I'd see Joe all the time and, um, and the Christmas was really hard so I think Joe 
was starting, like, you know, she was so supportive of the whole, everything we did, that I think the first year was, she was expecting lean, hard, and we delivered that. Um, and then the second year, she was less expecting it, <laughs> but we still delivered it. Um, so I think by about the second year, she was starting to really, you know, not being able, you know, cards being rejected at the supermarket when she's buying groceries, like just stupid stuff that a mother should never have to deal with, hopefully, you know, so, you know, one that you care about so much, you're trying to do everything you can for them to have at least a half normal life. And we're making her go through this terrible, terrible situations. And so I think she eventually came to me and like probably about two years in, so she was really patient um, and just said, Justin, is it gonna get better next year? Um, she didn't trust Andre anymore <laughs> and the way what he said because he's always so positive and she's like Justin is it going to get better I was like um, I really think it is but she said what if it's not better by this date or that date and I'm like well um, Andre and I talked about it and I think they had a conversation and he agreed to a date if it's not better by let's say April in you know third year um, we're going to look for jobs and we're going to forget this nonsense and you know and just realise that it wasn't a great idea and we didn't quite get there April came and went, and it was like a renegotiation. <laughs> it was like May or July, and then eventually about July and August, we sat down and was like, oh man, this is really tough, and it's really taking out on your family. Um, you know, we can't afford to do anything. We're working more hours than anyone. Um, maybe we should. And so we promised ourselves that by this date in another two months, we always gave ourselves another couple of months, but um, we would go and uh, find a job. And that's what happened, so we did. Um, we went and chatted to people in the industry. I got a job offer, Andre got a job offer. So, and we were like within a couple of days of calling it. And, um, and we, we drank some wine, sat down, and we're like, when we were both devastated by the, the idea of having to do that and give up, and we went, nah, fuck it. <laughs> Let's go back. And, um, and my poor sister, the, the poor thing, um, we just told her that we, we needed some more time because we thought we could do it, and she stuck with us. and. You know, now she's quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> was was there any? Uh, so you mentioned again uh, the the whole cough boys and, and how in the industry you had a really great reputation. Everyone assumed that you were doing really well. Was there was there any pressure from that from from people externally viewing uh, viewing it as a success? But as you mentioned, you you not having that much money coming in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily feel pressure. I, I think you we may have. We were so excited about everything we were doing that we were having heaps of fun. So there wasn't ever that, oh God, I feel like a fraud, blah, 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 because we were having the best time, even though we were like broke, <laughs> we were having the best time. Uh, so there was, I did, so we didn't probably feel that pressure. It was more pressure of the family, um, more pressure of actually, you know, what, we can't pay our bills next month, so we're gonna have to do something about that. And we we're always just catching up. Yeah. Um, so there was that financial pressure um, and the pressure of the family resulting from that, that was the main pressure. I didn't really feel it from the industry. The industry all thought we were lots of fun and we got won lots of awards and you know, it was it was a really good time because it was just like, it's just an opportunity to tr try the best wines that Australia had ever produced and sit down for long lunches with like all the famous people like Peter Lehman, he's now passed away, but you know, at the Barossa um, boardroom, which was his like lunch, Area, like his, his um, dining room and there was like it was called the Brossa boardroom and you know he's an interesting legend and we're sitting down with him and uh, Margaret his wife his uh, wife and you know just drinking booze talking about all the stories of you know what happened and he pretty much saved the Brossa in a sense um, the way um, you know they had some challenging times and he really stood up as a as an industry leader back then and really did kind of help save the industry and you, you have these moments with people like that and you're like far out this is really special um, and so we Really, had we been earning money, we would have been happy to live that lifestyle for the rest of whatever, I reckon. But unfortunately, we weren't. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, if if looking back, uh, the first idea that you had was group buying for wine, what, what Vinamofo is now. Do you think the business would be as successful without having gone through that, that four-year period? No, I think we needed to. It was part of the journey. I think the... One, we needed to build the networks. We needed to know the people that we could then call on when Vino Mofo started. So, you know, we were asking when our first day um, when we launched Vino Mofo was, was um, April 12th, 2011. Um, we were, we had no idea how, many, how much we were gonna sell and neither did we for the next month or so. Um, so we were asking these wineries with great brands, super strong brands, um, oh, do you mind if, we put your wine up for sale, it's gonna be the cheapest it's ever been seen in the entire market and we can't guarantee any sales. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, 
why on earth would we do that? And we're like, because you're our friends and we love you. <laughs> and, and that's the only thing that got us through that first part. So our network of wine people um, supported us in the early days um, to get the deals that no one else could get with no volume promises. Oh, and if you sell them, you can send them out, hopefully, by the way. <laughs> and we, you know, we eventually got, we started buying large volumes and taking ownership and sending it ourselves. And we've, you know, all those things. We're the fastest players in the industry. We like, we take more than anyone now of, of those types of wines. And, um, but in the early days, it was networks that we built through Quaff and Road to Vino and the check-in app and all those things that actually got us the relationships that we needed to have Vino Mofo. And then on top of that, it's not just relationships, it's the audience that we built. All the people watching our Quaff TV episodes, our Road to Vino episodes, all our Quaffers, like the members on the actual site, you know, we built up to you know, 30 or 40,000 people at that, at that time, you know, we're making no money, but we actually had a decent audience. Yep. Um, so when we launched Vino and we said, hey, this is our new project, we built such a great relationship because we hadn't been trying to push them anything. We, we'd been running like a charity, really. <laughs> we'd, yep. been, we'd been not trying to like, you know, get off of them anything um, like as far as reward for us. You know, it was all about um, you know, lots of video, lots of content, just building this community. And so when we said, oh, look, we're finally going to sell some wine, they're like, thank fucking... <laughs> it's about bloody time. And we're like, cool. So they actually wanted it to happen. And so we're like, awesome. So when we launched Vino, we had this lead-up campaign um, and they all signed up. And then on the first day, um, we sold, you know, more wine in that single day, which wasn't a lot, but then we had in the previous month doing other stuff. So... It was really cool. So yeah, it was the audience and it was the network. So we couldn't have done it without those two things. And that's what probably got us ahead of everyone else in that space who came in after trying to copy. Um, they didn't have the decade of experience and relationships that we'd built um, that, that enabled us to get the best wines at the best prices. Sure. How, how important do you think the, I mean, obviously you and Andre are extremely passionate and knowledgeable about, about the space. How important do you think it is for someone, whether it's in wine, whether it's in, in another industry, to, to be that passionate or, or know their market that well for them to, to run a business successfully? Um, look, I think it's, I personally think it's really, really important. I mean, I, I know that some kind of older business guys will say, um, that are less kind of emotionally attached to business and kind of look at it as numbers. But um, I think in today's day and age with the consumers and what they're demanding and the expectations they have around a brand and their relationship with that brand, I think you need to really be authentic and own it and um, really have a passion for what you're talking about. Because people feel that, you know, we built Vino, we built Quaff, we built Vino Mofo for us. Like we were our target audience, what would we love? Um, and so that's why it was so easy to kind of build this relationship with our audience because they were us. Like we, we wanted to hang out with them and drink wine and, and so we invited them to all the parties we went to. We, we showed them what we were drinking and they showed us what they were drinking through this entire journey and it was, it was really because we were designing it for us, you know what I mean? Our type of people. And that kind of really stood for that no bow ties and BS thing because we're, like, we're wine nerds um, at the heart of it. Andre and I just love wine, like, you know, I. I, you can't even explain how much we love wine. <laughs> but um, it's, I think because we had that real passion around wine, you kind of, you attract this audience that have that same love and passion for wine and they could feel it because it's authentic, it's real. They can hear it in the way you speak about how much you actually love this thing. Um, so I think it's really important that you are tied in really closely and you have that passion for your product, um, especially, especially more now than ever. Yeah. Sure. How did the, uh, so on, on the no bow ties and, and bullshit um, branding message that you guys have, I mean, obviously, you know, someone else could start a, a very similar company, same business model and, and everything, yeah. but I think what people can't replicate is, is the branding that, that Vinamopo has. Yeah. Um, how, did that, how did that start and how do you sort of maintain that as, as the company grows over time? Yeah, so the, um, the no bow ties and BS thing is an interesting one because that was where we started Quaff. The, the reason, one of the other, one of the reasons I, we built Quaff, I had studied wine, I'd grown up in wine, I'd worked for wineries holding tastings and, and I was about like say 25, 26 and I was walking into like expensive wine shops and going through the Italian range and the French range and for me who'd lived it, studied it and worked in it, I was walking into these like really stuffy um, places with these old dudes with, you know, bow ties and... <laughs> all around them and felt intimidated and I was like 
if I feel intimidated after my experience, could you imagine all the other people that want to understand wine and have a passion for it, how they would feel walking into this type of place? And so one of the big drivers early, and that we're talking 2006, you know, that's a long time, 10 years ago. Um, it was, there was a huge, it was a huge part of that was in the industry, you know, that, that kind of intimidation and the bow ties kind of brigade. And I think it was really important that we opened it up for everyone to be able to feel secure and comfortable and believe and trust their own palates. And so when we first started, we were really super passionate about that, going, forget all that bow ties and beer stuff, let's just enjoy wine for what it is. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing, but there shouldn't be any of this intimidation factor. Let's welcome everyone in. And so we we're kind of speaking to this young audience, um, younger audience. And even, you know, not so young sometimes, but who are just more aligned with that way of thinking. I think it's got a lot better over the years. Like, you can't claim that there's as much intimidation now because um, there's not a, there's so few of those bow ties and BS kind of people still in the industry. You know, they've kind of moved on, they've had to grow, they've had to adapt. Um, and all the younger people that are coming through are very much aligned with our, you know, with our way of thinking. There's still wankers in every industry because, they feel like you know once they know something, they this little bit of knowledge that they have over some people makes them a bloody expert, and they want to tell all their friends how amazing they are because they know where Barolo, why you know what a Barolo is compared to a white burgundy, like all that kind of wanker stuff. Which you know I love those wines, but you sh it shouldn't be used as intimidation against uh, over anyone. And so I think it's far less that bow ties BS than it's ever been, um, which is exciting. So. I think that that's not the driver anymore behind Vina Mofa. I think Vina Mofa is still very much being open, authentic, welcoming, trusty palate, that kind of stuff. And it's definitely aligned with the no bow ties and BS. Anyone who is opposite of that's not really welcome within our tribe. Um, but it's so much more than that now, you know what I mean? It's not just bow ties and BS. It's about wanting to do some good for the world. It's about being real. It's about being human. It's about you know making good decision, decisions. Um, it's, it's, it's an alignment of our team with our audience and we're very similar in our beliefs of how you should not just drink and enjoy wine, but how you should live your life. And we are so vocal about the way we think um, you should or we should. And it, uh, with the people that align with us, you know what I mean? It kind of brings us together and the people that don't fit within that, then we don't really mind that they're not part of our community. So it's, like, so the, so it's, so it's evolved. Yeah. yeah, but it's more. It more started from a place of authentic, authenticity of who you and Andre were yeah. and what you guys believed in, rather than going, we want to target the younger demographic who may not know. <laughs> yeah, that is, is, yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, call us lazy, but it was just <laughs> we were building it for ourselves, yeah. <laughs> and we were building it for our type of people, you know, and um, and it's certainly I, I love it when people talk about you know creating products for different. Pro it's the wine industry is terrible at it. So over the last, you know, it's getting better as you know most industries are, but. There were so many products that were brought onto the market, created because of a target market that they wanted to target, um, and like designed in a way to fit. It's so inauthentic, and it's like you can see through that so easily. Um, and I think that's what's important. We are very real and very open and very honest and very human. Um, and there's none of that crap <laughs> that exists in some of the big corps. Yeah, and I mean that's that's the way that you uh, you know you speak to your audience, how you relate to them, but also in in the products that you that you. Uh, showcase on, on your website as well so I think it was something like only 5% of the, the wines that you taste yeah. get on, onto the top so basically our, we, we target the premium to super premium part of the market um, it was the opposite of going broad range because you can't compete with the big guys on broad range so you know if you talk about um, our big you know uh, kind of competitor retailers you know the supermarket chains and um, that type of thing they have really broad ranges and um, if you try and compete with them on broad range, the fact that they're billion dollar companies has a real impact on how you can compete with buying power, um, you know, with, uh, with wineries. Um, but if you then focus on the higher or a part of the market, we focused on the premium to super premium, if you focus on a smaller part of the market and go all in on that, then you're leveling the playing field as far as buying power. And if you look at the, the big chains in Australia, you know, I think it's something like 80% um, of their volume um, goes through you know, the top 100 or 200 wines. They're all those commercial quantity produced wines, the stuff that you see on the floors of the retail chains, you know, the ones that they can buy millions of cases and that's where all their volume goes through. So then that, the balance of their volume, the 20% say, goes through everything else. And you know, if they've got 30,000 SKUs, and 80% of their volume is going through 
200, 20% of their volume is going through like 29,000 <laughs> SKUs. And then if you then take a part of that SKU, which doesn't have huge sell through compared to the other part, and you go premium, super premium, then there's another, let's say, 2,000 different wines or 2,000 different wineries. And you go, well, so all of those making premium, super premium of those wines, we're going to taste them all and we're going to pick 5% of them and they're the ones that we're going to feature. So we are taking 5% of a small part of the market um, and that means that the volume that we buy is far deeper than anyone else in the country. So even though you've got these big supermarket billion dollar you know, behemoths um, against you, we've actually got more buying power generally on the wines that we're buying. Like we buy all of the wine when we buy it. So um, it's, it's a really powerful place to be in that sense. You know, you niche it, you grab the best 5% and you, and you focus all your volume through those 5%, which means wineries. When we, when we call up a winery and say, we want to take your wine, um, we generally take all of it. You know, there's, there's, there's none left when, when, <laughs> we, when we bought it. It's because um, that's what is now required because we've got such focused range. Great. And uh, so you mentioned that you went when Vinamo first started. You started with 40,000 people who were super engaged, who had followed you for four years and were, you know, deeply, uh, deeply involved and uh, engaged with what you and Andre were, were doing. How do you then grow that to, is it 400,000 users that you've got? Yeah, well, we've got um, about 460,000, I think. Um, now, it keeps growing all the time, but um, it was, I think it's 400,000 about... Uh, four or five months ago, but I think it's about 460,000 now. And those 40,000 we're talking about with Quaff was just the audience, not all of them came across. Sure. Um, are, you know, it's probably five or 10,000 of those really came across to Vino. When we launched on day one, we, had, we, had, we only had like about a thousand of them across. And then they came across more and more and more as, as we were building. Um, but yeah, the, so let's say, let's say it was you know, a thousand to start and we eventually got 10,000 from that audience. Um, the, the, how we've got it to 450,000 is, um, well, I guess our biggest referral, um, our, sorry, our biggest source of new customers is referral. So we just focused on getting the product so good um, and the customer service side of the business so good um, that people told their friends. And I know it sounds simplistic, but it is still our biggest source of new customers today, yet our marketing budgets are massive now compared to what they were. It was obvious that it was going to be our biggest source of new customers then because we didn't have any money because we couldn't spend any money on marketing. But even today when we're spending a lot of money on marketing, our biggest source is still referral. So I think it's you get the product so bloody good that people tell their friends about you. And then once they try, you treat them so bloody well that they tell their friends about you. And I think that's probably how we've got there. Um, we've had lots of PR as well, you know, like when we uh, started the business about, um, you know, a year in, Catch of the Day, um, uh, we ended up doing a deal where Catch of the Day bought 70% of us. Um, you know, we were growing so fast, we just needed to scale, you know, super quickly. And the way to do that is either take a whole chunk of money or go into partnership with a, someone who's got a huge audience. Um, and we ended up settling on Catch of the Day. They bought 70% of our um, business. And, you know, the PR around that was huge. And, you know, more so than the, from their customer side, because it wasn't as a strong alignment as we originally hoped um, as far as customers, but the PR around it was massive. And, you know, and the PR when we first launched Vino Mofo, and it was called Vino Mofo, you know, it's wine mother. Um, so you kind of get noticed. <laughs> yeah. um, and so we've got lots of press along that journey. And even to this day, we still get probably more press than most startups can. Um, and it's just because we're so open and out there and um, we, we're so willing to, to speak our minds and stand for something. So, um, you know, and we've won lots of awards. And so all that leads to, you know, this great PR machine that has enabled us to um, get a great audience. So if you, put in, if you put in a great product that people want to tell their friends about, and like a lot of PR around this business over the journey, and they're probably the two biggest contributors to how we've got to the 450 plus thousand people now. Yeah, um, just on the name, can you, uh, I know it's, it's, it's a pretty funny story, but for our listeners, can you kind of share how the- Yeah, sure. The, Am the I allowed to swear on this? Absolutely, <laughs> Okay, absolutely. good. I, I never know, so I'm always very careful. Actually, I'm never careful, but I always, <laughs> but I always regret it when I'm not. Um, so we, are, we were originally gonna call it Vino Mojo, and so Vino Mojo was like, get your mojo working. Um, it was a name that Andre actually came up with. And um, 
and we were super excited about it. We designed the website, we designed the logo, we designed the like the the launch campaign, the social. We had the you know all the profiles that we needed on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. And um, super excited, built up his audience. Vino Mojo's coming, had the countdown, and then literally two days out from launch, which was a Friday, it was the afternoon before everyone was about to go home for the for the week weekend. We were launching like midnight on the Sunday, I think it was, and um, we get this letter. There's a cease and desist around a trademark issue. So some a public company that owned the term Mojo as a one word within a, the wine category um, had threatened us to um, get an injunction to stop us launching because they knew that we were about to launch. And so we called our chief solicitor because we had no money and said, hey, mate, um, we've got this cease and desist. Um, it's claiming trademark and he's like, let me look into it. He looked into it and it was basically, um, it was basically in a different category. Like it was category like 33 compared to 35 or something like that. They were, they were the two categories. I don't know which one was in which, but he said, you win because it's in a different category. It's one word, you know, it's fine. Um, but unfortunately, because that business had been trading for like five years or whatever it was, at to that point, they could get an injunction in order to stop you trading until the court case was heard. And so the court, I was like, how long is that going to be? And he's like, oh, it could be anything from a month to six months. And I'm like, oh, God. And we, could, you know, we knew the wave was coming. We knew that group buying daily deals thing was coming. We knew it was perfect timing. We knew that if we delayed much, there'd be, there'd be first mover advantage to someone else. Um, and, you know, there was, it, we just had to do it super quickly. So we were like, we can't wait. We just can't wait. So we called this, the CEO of this public company and said, hey, you know, you know, we're, you know grown ups, let's just have an honest conversation. Like, we're going to win this. Um, and, uh, and so it's just a matter of time. So, you know, do you want to go through this injunction thing? He's like, he, I'm not going to tell you what he said because it wasn't very nice, but it was something referencing that we weren't very wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so it, the conversation did not end as we would have liked. <laughs> and so we hung up the phone, sat down, and as Andre and I do, whenever we have these big challenges and we need to make a big decision, we opened a couple of bottles of wine um, and proceeded to drink them. And uh, we started working out what the hell we were supposed to do. So we decided that if we changed the logo or changed the name, um, just a tiny bit, one letter or something, then we wouldn't have to redesign the whole bloody thing and we could change it more easily. Um, our creative team could fix up what it needed to fix up um, and we could still do it on time and people wouldn't notice too much and we could tell a, like a funny story, you know, or uh, we could tell the story um, if we could come up with something good. So then, you know, two bottles of wine in, we were like, okay, vino moto, vino modo. And eventually I said to Andre, um, this was like towards the end of the second bottle of wine. Um, why don't we just call it Vino Mofo for the motherfuckers that are trying to steal that mojo? <laughs> and we were like, and we laughed and we were like, no, we can't, can we? And we we're like, oh, could we? And we laughed a bit more and we went and we tried other things and we kept coming back to it going, hold on, it'd actually be really fun because it would be a story where, that we could use um, to tell, you know, the media going, you know, it's, we're going to keep it for a month or two. It was, it was us just giving the finger to the guys that were trying to stop us from using a name, knowing that they couldn't, blah, blah, blah. And um, so Vino Mofo stood um, and it, it was and it was one of those the best things that's ever happened to us. You know what I mean? Like it really it really aligned with the no bow ties and BS. It made you stand out. Um, so it's one of those like really fortunate things that happened. And um, then when we launched it and everyone's going, Vino Mofo, the younger people knew what it meant. And they thought that was funny because we were you know, having a bit of fun. And because they knew the story, it was us giving the finger to the guys that tried to stop us. Um, and then the older, some of the older guys didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> and then their kids told them. <laughs> um, but then eventually our, mof our members were calling each other Mofos and Mofets. And it, this whole vernacular built around this thing and it was super exciting. Andre hated it. <laughs> Andre wanted to change it back as soon as we could. But anyway, it got, it, it got such momentum that we just left it as it was. And then we stopped fighting. Like we didn't even fight. And then every couple of months or so, we'd get like another folder from the other guys who were still trying to fight this trademark. And we're like, I don't even know why you're trying to. We, it's Vino Mofo. We're not even fighting it. And eventually, like seriously, two years later, we get this letter from the trademark, whatever the body's called. And it said... Um, Congratulations, your trademark has been approved, you've won. <laughs> like, oh, far out. We didn't even try and we won. And um, so now we own Vino Mojo and Vino Mofo. And, you know, we'll never use it again, much to Andre's disappointment. But, um, yeah. Um, 
So, so something again, uh, you know, obviously you've, you've taken the business uh, tremendously far over, over the last few years, but um, is it correct that you sold the business in between for a little while and then, and then bought it back? Yeah, so we, we didn't sell all of it, we sold 70% of it. What had happened is when we launched and it started getting um, so much attention and we were growing so quickly, we came on the radar of a lot of our competitors who started to use quite um, uh, uncompetitive um, or competitive like tactics um, and you know started putting pressures on suppliers and stuff so we started having to deal with like the repercussions of what that wineries were dealing with by dealing with us you know like um, they were risking relationships that they had for a couple of friends like we were you know we were good mates with them all but they were also putting at risk you know, big, large sums of wines that they were selling to other people because we were offering their wines at a better price than anyone by a long way. So obviously people are going to be a bit pissed off <laughs> um, that we could do that, especially when we weren't buying that much volume. Uh, so what happened was this added pressure was coming onto onto the suppliers, which means our supply was starting to get harder for us. And it was one of those moments where we're like, oh, shit, like we are on such a great run um, uh, the mofos love us it's growing super quick the wine's amazing and all of a sudden supply started getting tight we're like oh god this could ruin us so we worked out what we needed to do and that was we needed to grow to a size where we were a viable alternative to all the other suppliers which means you know like if they dealt with us we'd buy all their wine you know what I mean so the, so when other people started complaining the supply, the wineries could say guys what do you mean they buy all that wine they buy more than you do <laughs> so what so when you can buy as much as they can then come and talk to me about your complaints about the pricing we give to them um, so that was what we needed to get to we weren't there yet so we worked out how do we get to that point and that was either raise some cash to grow spend it on marketing to grow to a size where now our deals are now selling that much um, or go into a partnership with a media player or like a big um, company, online company that's got a similar audience or something. And so we were dealing with a media company, we were dealing with some angels who wanted to put money in and there was a lot of interest because all the metrics were all pointing in the right direction by that stage, you know, as opposed to all our previous businesses when we'd pitch for money and no one put their hand up. Um, this one, everyone put their hand up. So we really did have the pick of it um, and it was really exciting part of the market. Everyone was, you know, super excited about it. It was really cool. And eventually ended up um, going with uh, Catch of the Day. And so they bought 70%. It was about a year after we launched um, the business. And then we were part of the Catch group. You know, the founders still own 30%. But, um, and we were there for about a year. And um, it was a great experience. We were in all the management meetings with all the different businesses that were part of that group. So we heard all the, you know, all the stories, like all the failures, all the successes, and what people thought of those. And it was great. It was so awesome to be surrounded by people that were leading in each of those spaces. Um, so we learned a lot. Um, but eventually, we we lost we lost the kind of drive and passion, I guess. Um, that we had when it was just us, you know, it was it was just it was on our back to make this make or break it, and you know whatever upside was all our upside, whatever downside was all our risk, um, and that you know keeps you really energized and it keeps you really excited. And so about a year in, um, we approached uh, Gabby um, uh, uh, Lebovich, who's one of the brothers that started Catch of the Day, and he's still a good mate. So we ended that relationship really well. Um, and we kind of, we, we approached him and said, uh, Gabby, <laughs> uh, how would you feel about this? And, he, and, you know, Gabby's a good negotiator, so he's like, oh, that'd be pretty expensive. <laughs> and we went back and forth, and eventually, um, you know, a couple of months later, we, um, we managed to come up with a price that both parties were happy with, and uh, we bought it back with the help of a small group of investors who took 25% of the company. Um, so we ended up with 75%, and these small group investors ended up with 25%. And, um, and it was the best decision we ever made. And so we settled on, we bought it back and settled on June 30th, 2013. Um, so end of financial year in 2000, uh, the 2013 financial year. And um, you know, gave them all our money, um, had no money in the bank. Um, we had like, I don't know, about 13 or 14 employees, moved into an office in Richmond on Bridge Road. And uh, it was so exciting. Like the energy was back, you could feel it. Um, and because there was, uh, you know, it was, you had no money and you knew you had wages and rent and stuff to pay, but you knew that this thing was working, so there would be money coming in, we hoped. <laughs> and so it was like at 12.02, you know, a.m. or something, we were like refreshing to see if there was any sales. <laughs> and eventually one came through, it was a couple hundred dollars and we were all online and we all called each other, 
it's back on, <laughs> you know, it's back on, it's working, it's so cool. Um, and, you know, just refreshing it to see, and it was like real again, it had this real energy. Um, and the team was so excited about it all. Um, and so we ended up growing the business super fast um, as soon as we brought it back, because I think renewed energy, and also all the mofos that had uh, started with us, and when we sold into cats, it was like, oh, you know, a bit of a sellout kind of thing, even though they are a disruptor in their own space compared to the big guys. Um, it was, some of them were like, oh, I just wait, but the boys don't need us anymore. Yet they were like, we're back, guys. And they were like, oh, the boys are back. And all of a sudden it was this, like, they just came out of the woodworks and the numbers just went through the roof. And we're like, wow, this is the best decision we ever made. Um, so it's super exciting. Um, something that, that isn't talked about enough in the ecosystem, so a lot of obviously people are like, how do I get my first investor on board, how do I get someone to say yes? Mm. Uh, what isn't talked about enough is what happens when you've got all of these options, as, as you were mentioning, when things are working out well and suddenly everyone wants to be part of that. How do you, how do you sift through the, the different options and the different offers that are on the, on the board? Yeah, so I, I think this really interesting actually question because I've had this exact conversation with so many founders because we obviously were in this position recently. Um, you know the the the, the catch um, the catch transaction was different because that was us needing to scale, um, and it wasn't really like um, like a VC type thing. It was like joining forces kind of thing. Um, but when uh, the, this latest round that we've just done, which was a twenty five million dollar round, uh, it was Blue Sky who ended up taking the whole round. Um, the, so when we were going through that process, we'd spent the last two years building relationships with VCs like all over the world because we knew at some point there was potential that we would need to go larger quicker. Uh, so, but we didn't need it because we we're always profitable. So it was like, we never really needed it. And Andre and I were very protective of this thing that we'd built because we didn't want anyone telling us what to do. We'd had this experience with going to the cash group and they were wonderful, but it still felt different. Even though they tried to, didn't put any pressure on us whatsoever, they're like, guys we bought in because we wanted you to run the company so don't so there was no pressure but there's still this changed feeling in you because yeah, you've got someone different energy different energy about so, it for sure and so we didn't we didn't want that anymore and because we were growing so quick we were growing 100 percent anyway um, and faster back then um and we were super profitable so we didn't actually need anyone's money unless we wanted to go super large so we thought, well, while there's so much interest, let's just build the relationships around the world. You know, we had American, Asian, and Australian VCs all kind of, you know, had these chats going on for two, three years. Um, and so we just got to know people really well. Um, and we had, all the, we had all the connections there if we ever needed to. So when we decided that we were going to, <clears throat> I started calling around the founders that I know that had taken on serious money, like people like the guys from Canva, or Shoes of Prey, or you know, just like all, all the people that have been through this um, before, and all, you know, there's a real community of founders in Australia, and we all support each other. You know, I know that VCs talk about, you know, they all talk amongst their circle. Founders all talk amongst their circle. So if you do something against a founder, you, there's a, the story gets out super quickly, yep. and so there's you've really got to respect both communities and both relationships, and so. We asked all the people who we needed to ask, you know, any bad experiences, any good experiences. And I think it was um, Michael from Shoes of Prey, um, who's, an, who's, a, who's a fucking legend. He's really awesome. He was really helpful for us. Um, he just said, you know what, Justin, I think it was either him or Cliff from Canberra, but um, I think they both kind of went along the same lines. You're going you're gonna to be in this relationship for a long time. You know, VCs want a return on their money, of course. So there is that business aspect. But in the end, they're all gonna want that. So it's more important how you get along with these people. And you know, are they human? Are they real? And so we kind of really took that on board. So all the VCs that we got to know, we'd go out to lunches and with them and dinners and we'd just hang out with them long enough to know what they would be like to deal with ongoing. And also when you know the chips were down, you know, your backs against the wall type, we wanted to suss out what that would look like. And um, <clears throat> so in the end, we chose Blue Sky because Elaine, Ben and Nick fucking legends they are so nice um, and we get along with them they love wine we go out to dinners all the time and lunches and they're just really good people so you know I couldn't I couldn't recommend Blue Sky highly enough like they're just absolute legends all the way up to the top you know the managing director Mark it's, they're just absolute legends and real human beings and so you know there's a lot of people in the VC world that are not very human <laughs> but they are and they're awesome so I think probably make sure you talk to other founders that have dealt with all the people you're looking at, and then two, get to know them really well and choose people that you trust and you get along with.
Absolutely. And I, I think that that doesn't just apply to VCs, it's also co-founders, it's Absolutely. suppliers, that's everyone. Absolutely. Everyone in Absolutely. the business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's what's next? You, As you mentioned, $25 million round. Um, what's what's next for Vinamofo? Uh, so we are taking Vinamofo Global is on one half of it. <clears throat> and on the other half, we're doubling down in Australia. So we um, we think we've got five to six times growth in Australia still possible, which is really exciting, um, <clears throat> just in, this, in the current format. And then we are launching globally because we honestly believe that Vinamofo is the best way to buy wines anywhere. Um, it's the model, it's the way we do it, it's the wines we choose, it's the, you know, so it's a curation. It's, it's, I think this package is the best possible way for people that love wine to buy wine anywhere. So it's our mission for everyone to be able to experience good wine. That's part of our mission, yeah. We want to do some good for the world and have some fun too, but it's, it's like we want everyone to experience good wine. So good wine, we mean like real wine, wines made by real people with passion and history and all that type of stuff, not the commercial stuff that's made in millions of cases. So good wine. So we want to be able to do that for everyone, not just Australians. <laughs> so we, we devised a plan as how we're going to take Vinamofo Global. The two kind of paths were either let's go all in on one market, like a US or a China, which we almost did, um, or, uh, and, and that was going to be expensive, people on the ground, and it was going to take a couple of years um, to work out whether it was working well. And if it wasn't, you're like, well, we spent two years on this market, it hasn't worked. Well, the rest of the market's probably got more and more people going in to have a look at, and it's going to get harder and harder, and it's going to, we're going to be like 100 years old before we get to the rest of the world. So we decided that we'd go in with a representation of what Vino Mofo was, like a light version, which is like, basically, we have lots of events on site at Vino Mofo. It's like, you know, end of run sales and like, you know, just big boom sales and they've got like 70 or 100 wines at a time. And we thought that is the best representation of what Vino does because it's so exciting. It opens up for a couple of days and it's, the, it's like 100 of the best deals you've ever seen in your entire life and then it closes because they all sell out. Yeah. And so that really represents a lot of what Vino Mofo is. So let's do an event everywhere. And so we, uh, we identified the markets and it's like an online kind of pop-up event for a couple of days until everything sells out. And um, <clears throat> we identified the markets and we chose New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, US, UK and China, those six markets over the next 12 months. Um, and we'll, we'll do this countdown like we did when we started Vino Mofo. We'll build up this like pre kind of event excitement with a countdown and you know, like little hints as to what was coming. Um, and then uh, we'd open it up and then we'd, we'd, it, would be, um, it would be open for like a couple of days or until things sold out. Um, and it was super exciting. So we launched the first one in New Zealand like two weeks ago. Um, uh, launched about two weeks ago and it went super, super well. It was like, it was, we had so much buzz. Um, and, that, um, and then once we'd, and the, the plan was, once we'd done these like sales in different markets, we'd roll them out every month or so in a new market. And once we'd seen some traction in each market, then we'd follow it up with people on the ground and do the full Vino Mofo experience. So New Zealand was like two weeks ago, went really well. So we've already planned for the second one. That's in another couple of weeks. Um, I think it's in August. Um, and then uh, we've got Singapore in September and we've got the States in November. Um, so it's like, it's, it's full on and it's crazy and it's good and the, the reaction in New Zealand to the first one was so good that we've just doubled down. We want it, we're going to triple the numbers on the on the second sale, and then if that one continues in the same trajectory, we'll open ground. We'll open the site up completely on the third sale, probably. Um, and Singapore is in like heavy planning at the moment, and um, we'll you know launch that. Uh, I think that's yeah September. Um, super exciting. It's just so much fun. Like you've got. You know, Vino Mofo, if, you know, like New Zealand's not very far away, but we're a global company and that's kind of exciting. And when you're like talking, like you're shipping containers from like France and Italy to Australia and then out to Hong Kong and Singapore and US and you, it's so much fun. Like yeah. it's just a whole nother level. And it feel, feels like we're a startup again in each of these markets. Like I'm, I'm going to talk over there with like the startup communities. Like do the same groundswell that we did in Australia. You know, like look after the startup communities, look after the disruptors, look after the young people and really get amongst that community and build the groundswell, get into the uh, media, talk to all the journos that talk about startup and business and whatever. And it's, that, it's like a really exciting phase again. So we're, we're off to New Zealand next week to do that. Um, and then we'll be off to Singapore a couple of weeks later to do the same thing. And so Andre and I are gonna be like getting to know so many amazing, young, exciting entrepreneurs, um, all over the world, and that's like one of the most exciting things ever. Yeah, no, it's, it's super exciting times for Vinamofo. 
um, and also a different set of challenges, I, I assume, as well, coming up. Um, mindful of your time, just quickly before we, we wrap this interview up. Um, so I, I was reading somewhere that you were actually looking for looking to invest in a uh, delivery-based startup for a year yep. or so before you, you ended up investing in, in Nourish. Yep. Um, from the other side of the table, so having gone through that, that eight-year journey, and now looking, well, having made an investment in, in a startup, uh, what, what was it that made you invest in Nourish as opposed to some of the other companies that you might have looked at? Yeah, so uh, it comes down to the founders. So for us, I guess we knew how freaking hard it is to make something work, and we knew how much we had to pivot and change to make it work. So even when you're investing in a business for the, like in its infancy, it might look completely different so the only, the only thing that is going to be the same is the founders. <laughs> and the founders make or break a business. Like if you get great founders and the first one doesn't work or the second one doesn't work or the third one or in our case the fourth one, um, the fifth one might just work. And I think so backing founders is where I think what I've learned is the most important thing when you're looking at business. I mean obviously the business has got to stack up but even if it doesn't, they'll work it out because they're smart and they're good and they've done it before or they've got the experience or the smarts to actually make it happen. So I think... Um, I think it was all about the founders. I mean, I looked at other, I tried so many different ones and ones that were in the market and already established, still small, but growing and established. Whereas when um, Scott pitched me um, Nourish, we were both doing a startup judge, like we were judging for a startup competition through um, York Butter Factory, I think, and um, through Darcy Norton, but we were both as judges. And I was telling him about this, you know, I was, I was trying all these different um, ready-made meal delivery businesses and I, I wanted to invest in one because I thought back then that the time was right. It was a few years ago um, and, you know, it was going to be a bit of a land grab and I, I loved the concept of, and, you know, I, I was eating that way most of the time anyway because, you know, I'm really busy and I like healthy food, but, um, you know, it's really hard to always cook. And So I loved the concept. And then he's like, well... Um, <laughs> Funnily enough. <laughs> yeah, enough. My partner and I are, uh, are looking to launch one. It's called nourish and so it was a big decision it came down to two one that was established who were lovely people um, and doing like doing quite well um, or this one that we had to create from scratch with um, Amanda and Scott and in the end it came down to Andre and I sitting down with the founders enough times to go we've got to bet on the founders and so we bet on Scott and Amanda great um, and so for, for anyone that wants to get in touch with you, follow you, or, or the Vinamofo story, what's, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Uh, probably just through social. I've got um, Twitter, which I'm you know, on regularly, which is Justin L. Dry. Um, and then on Facebook, just Justin Dry. There's a, a business page there. Um, and if you, um, and it was, uh, same thing for Vinamofo. It's got the same handles in all the channels. And I'm on Instagram, so it's Vinamofo, same name. Just all in my name. So if you want to connect, do it that way. Great. Thanks a lot, Justin. That was that was tremendous. Uh, thanks for sharing your story, and hopefully we'll get you back in six months or a year and, and hear how your international expansion is going. Awesome. Well. Thank you for having me, Ray. Thanks for listening to episode three of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, uh, you can find show notes for my interview with Justin, along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. In the next episode, I interview Alex McBride, who's the founder of The Fifth Watches, a watch brand that has dominated Instagram, gaining a following of over 500,000 followers across their social media accounts. Now for the question of the day, what is something that you would willingly do for the rest of your life if it paid you enough money to survive? Send through your responses, uh, either Snap or in, through Insta at Startup Playbook, tweet at us at Playbook Startup, or comment if you're listening on Facebook or YouTube. Thanks once again for listening, and I'll see you at the next episode.